Uh, hello, everyone from the beaches of beautiful Maui. Don't I wish. Still in my shop. Just wanted to go live. Thank goodness my wife has finally figured this out. There were some uh, threats made, but uh, here we are. Hopefully she'll be here tonight to answer all the questions that we have for Jimmy Diresta. He is uh, just a Facebook or a YouTube phenomenon and uh, can't wait to talk to him and uh, see what kind of questions everybody has. We are live on Facebook. I hope everybody is uh, uh, ready. Tonight we have Jimmy Diresta. Hey guys, what's up? How's everybody doing? Uh, we're uh, we're gonna uh, let folks kind of get into the room a little bit sure. here. Um, you know, I have seen your work for years, and you thank you. Uh, you are uh, uh, unique to say the least. Um, well, thank you very much. You, you don't just do wood; you also do a lot of metal, and, and yeah. that is uh, you know that combined of. Uh, uh, wood and metal, along with uh, uh, what show is it uh, that I absolutely love these days? Uh, uh, the knife making show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Forged and Fire is a great Forged show. Forged and Fire. Every time I see it, I think, Jimmy, he would <laughs> ass on this show. I never heard from those guys. Yeah. I, I'd have to think hard. If it, it's a weird thing. They let you on that show, but they don't let you uh, promote you know, your, personal, your personal brand. If well, you notice, they, they never tell anybody's last name on that show, which I think is a bit of a disservice. Nah, I think if you went on that show, everybody would be like, there's Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a little bit more of a following, but some young guys up and coming, you know, sure. they think it's a big deal to get on that show. And then they, they kind of basically, you know, well, don't show I, your identity, which is crazy to me. If you get on that show, I'm thinking people are looking you up if they really <laughs> like what you do. So... Well, thank you. Hopefully, this um, microphone. I'm trying to keep the microphone from scratching. Oh, it's it's all good. Matter of fact, it uh, it really is. And, and I, I have to again thank my wife for getting us hooked up to Ethernet. She has. Uh, I, I got to tell you, there were a lot of hillbilly curse words that yeah. I heard. <laughs> no, I've been on a few of these zooms, and you know, there's always technical difficulties. But the good thing about you know what's going on right now is I think a lot of these these technical difficulties are going to get ironed out more and more and more just the way cell phone technology did. Yeah. And it's, it really has just, uh, it, it's been quite a trial. I don't know if you, you, uh, knew that my first guest was Izzy. Uh, oh yeah, I did. I saw, I saw that in the after fact, I didn't realize it was going until it was over. And it was, I, I am sad to say an ultimate failure. I could not get him up on screen. It was oh. all fault. Um, come to find out, you have to replace your computers once every ten years, and uh, so I am. Uh, I am now up and running, and, and as you can see no lag. It's it's just a terrific setup now. It is. It is. The sun's going down outside my window. If I have to, I'll close the shade in a minute. Oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, now let's see here. We still got a couple minutes before we kind of go. Well, we're already live on Facebook. Uh, sure. And everyone, please excuse the beagle. Um, she's oh, beagles, beagles <laughs> bark too much. Yeah, beagle and a lab, so it's a bad combination. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, start at about seven o'clock. Um, we're going to uh, start answering questions, and of course, sure. most of them are going to be directed. <laughs> What do you got right behind you? How big is that a 20 inch? Uh-oh, Alex, you're frozen. <laughs> okay. Please Sorry. excuse me. my internet connection's lost. You can hear me, I can hear you. Now plug that back in and let me get rid of Oh, the dog, the dog, <laughs> the dog hit the wire. I think the dog kicked the wire. We are back. What is the dog kicked the wire? Oh my God. Uh, we have a brand new lab that is just a year old and she gets frisky and she just did rabbit running around the shop. 
I saw it. Crowd, it just, it, it could not have happened at a better time. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're pretty close to seven o'clock. I, I hope that uh, a lot of folks have joined us. I, I hope that uh, there are a lot of questions uh, for Jimmy here. Um, and, you know, Jimmy and I kind of have a, a passion. We both love band saws. Uh, yep. I, I would love to have as many band saws as you have. <laughs> I lost count. <laughs> I don't know how many I have. I lost count. You've probably forgotten more than I ever learned on a band saw. But, uh, you know, I, I know there are just a ton of questions out there that uh, yeah. you're not only on the band saw, but I mean, tell me real quick before we get started. Sure. You said you were videotaping today and yeah. you were doing a new product and a new video. Tell oh, everybody yeah. what that was. Uh, I'm making, a, a, if you follow my Instagram, I just recently posted a picture of it. It's a, it's an image of, uh, I'm making a, a mallet, a big giant mallet. And it's fun. It's, it's been a, a great project. It involves lathe, uh, blacksmithing, a lot of different stuff. Um, band saw work, in fact. Um, I made this big giant mallet you can see here. Probably weighs about 50 pounds. It's uh, it's a tree trunk of a piece of locust, and and the and the the hammer handle is a uh, a piece of ash. Well, you know, and I you also showed me a picture earlier of you doing some metal work. Um, oh yeah, we did. I did a little bit of blacksmithing last night. This one, I waited until Wednesday. Every week, I have an idea that I want to do, especially now since quarantine started. I've been kind of hitting it pretty regularly once a week. And every Monday morning, I have like a new idea to begin working on. And I had a few just like administrative tasks to deal with Monday and Tuesday. And I was like, I waited till Wednesday to start this because I'm like, this is going to be super easy. This will be a two-day build. And then when I started getting into the blacksmithing part of it, which I didn't really anticipate, and then I got into the idea of maybe making this feed down through the top of the head of the hammer. So it's like a, like a European-style hammer where the taper holds the head on from the top down as opposed to the way we do it in America where we hammer the handle up inside, which is always a little different, whole different set of science circumstances. And then uh, I had to make a, a reamer that went from three inches to two and a half inches. That's 12 inches long. And then I figure out how to do that. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I should have started this on Monday. <laughs> but see, that's the thing I love about your detail is you don't just say, hey, I want to make a big hammer. I want to make a big hammer that will never fall apart and work right. perfect every time. And that taper idea, I think, is terrific. That's right. You know, that kind of came to me while I was working on the lathe. I started, I left that end of the hammer handle wider. I figured I'd get to it. And then as I'm working on it, I'm like, wow, let me just make this like a, the type of European hammers I get where it just comes in from the top and stays in the top. It'll never come out. Yeah. And you always just, and I leave out about an inch or two sticking out of the top. And you just always tap that on the ground and the hammer head is, it just tightens up. Yeah. And it just about a five awesome. degree. There's no yeah, way to get them all. Four or five degree taper, and that's it. It's and but the big challenge on this one, and there always is one challenge or another. I needed to make that that taper tool to make that long taper inside of the the head, and that was a fun one. I it did, and it didn't come to me right away. I, yesterday morning, I thought the idea was going to be making another shape on the lathe, and then cutting a groove in it, and then inserting a blade, you know, a long blade, which I could have made out of any kind of steel. Then this morning as I'm laying in bed, I'm like just about to get up and I'm like, hey, stupid, why don't you just make a, you know, make a frame of a, of a taper on the plasma table. And so I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be at the lathe again, which obviously takes more time. So I just plasma cut a uh, taper, which is on my Instagram, that with a, you know, a reamer. And, and that worked perfectly. Sweet. Well, um, I, I'm, again, uh, everybody that watches what you do could learn something and, and put it into anything. It, it doesn't matter whether Thank you're you. a hammer or something else. I mean, these ideas, uh, that's what it's all about. And yep. sometimes you don't even realize that you're teaching someone something when you show this. You just, it's the way you do it. And it may not be the perfect way. It may sure. not be the right way, but it's your way and someone <laughs> else can adapt. Yeah, my philosophy is transformation. That is it. Like you start out in one particular material in some shape and you transform it into something else. So if I do a video and there's not so much transformation, I'm a little sketchy on whether I even want to publish it or not. But 
I won't go into it unless I know there's some heavy duty transformation. Like I start out with tree trunks and then I have a, a hammer. So I love in this it. case, it's some good stuff. All right. Uh, we are definitely past the seven o'clock hour. Are you ready for your first question? Of course. <laughs> All right. Sandra, uh, by the way, say hello to Sandra, my wife. She never gets on camera, but she you will hear her voice. Oh, good. Jeff um, wants to know, Jimmy, have you ever come across a NAP, K-N-A-P-P, joint machine in any of your antique machine searching? A NAP, a NAP, a NAPA joint joining machine? No, I never did. I never heard of that brand. Uh, NAP is N A K N A P P. K N A P P. No, I never did. I never heard of that brand, but of course, I don't know everything. I don't know. I don't claim to know everything, but I never did see that. I don't know if that's a vintage name or if that's like a new name. Uh, I've never heard of that myself. So, uh, you know what? Now he's going to make us both do a little research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. The way my, the way I, I, you know, I don't know if I'm I'm blessed or if I have an angel or whatever. I'm not that spiritual, but the uh now that somebody said that then it will pop up oh yeah you know it's funny it, I, I, that for me that always happens i'm very lucky that way i even got an email from a fan recently who who asked me he's like you seem to get a lot of things that just kind of fall in your lap he's like how does that happen to you and, and my advice to him was just he, the, the kid is amazing he's this this kid sean who does amazing youtube videos sean hogan i said just do what you do you know just just to be a good person and you know don't lie and don't cheat and i think good things good karma will come to good people amen brother all right what's our next question gus ask if jimmy jimmy what is the most interesting project you have not done yet oh <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I answer this question a lot. I, I either want to build a motorcycle or build a car. And that's why recently I just got this old Cadillac. And that Cadillac is going to be my proving ground where I could just do some modification on it and not really worry too much about the net result. It's really more of an exercise and practice. So making cars is something I always wanted to do. We got this go-kart race coming up in July as long as the pandemic doesn't uh, carry on too long we're going to do a go-kart i have a i own a race car i own a go-kart track in my town i bought the the little town in the middle of town there's a race car go-kart track that was abandoned and i bought it and now i have the track and i have a couple of buildings on it i'm going to make it my my center of operations ultimately but i will keep the racetrack so we can have fun and i'm going to invite some people out so making a go-kart is one of those projects i believe you said you were going to turn that cadillac into a caddy truck well, you know, it's funny. I want to do that with a four-door sedan. I want to do that with a with a four-door, like a, free, a Fleetwood Brougham or something like that. Not with this one. This is a this is beautiful as is, so I'm not going to do that. A lot of people ask me. That being said, we have the Catskill Mountain Maker Camp coming up in October. And for that event, I might remove the deck lid and install a bandsaw in the trunk so that I can go there and just cut stuff out of the, the trunk lid of the bandsaw. Just, I'll, st I'll stand up on a stool right in the back of the Cadillac. I'll bolt the band saw right to the back. We want to see that. <laughs> yeah, that's something I probably will do. As a matter of fact, I want to come up there and be with you when you do that. You're going to have to adjust my band saw for me because that's one thing you're good at and it's one thing I know I'm bad at. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> Sam, what's our next question? Sean wants to know the blade specs, TPI, and width for metal and wood? I personally like a 14 TPI. That is the, the my, my main blade. It gets a little hot for wood. It's good for metal, but you also have to slow it down for if you're going to cut on metal. Um, if I'm cutting on uh, like a real metal bandsaw and it's like a desktop unit, like the ones you hold in your hand, 18 TPI is pretty nice. Um, but, you know, like the bigger ones that cut uh, like a horizontal bandsaw for chopping metal, I use a 10 TPI typically. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I also go on eBay and whatever's available. I just look up cool stuff that guys have old stock and I buy, you know, I try different blades, but typically a 14 TPI is what I've always used for wood and, mid and cutting plastic and metal. Obviously for resawing, I would use a four TPI, like a half inch deep blade. Um, but if I'm just cutting letters and shapes and a little bit of my carving, I'll do a 14, but a 14 is a slow blade. You gotta, you gotta go slow with it. But that's that's typically my arsenal. I'm I'm with you. Um, when it comes to resawing, I do like a four tooth up to six inches. Anything over that, uh, I like to go to a three tooth for inch. 
uh, mm -hmm. clear that dust out. Um, and, you know, I don't do much metal, but I will tell you that one of my favorite blades to use when I do bandsaw boxes is a 1 8 inch 14 tooth per inch. Yep, that's uh, my, my go to. What, uh, you know, it just, it leaves the inside of the drawers pretty smooth. Um, Timber, Timberwolf is typically the brand I use. Well, uh, if you've never tried a Carter, you'll never use another one again. Uh, I'm open. I'm open to it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I'll get you a few sent up there. You just let okay. me know um, what sizes you need, and we'll get them sent to you. Terrific. All right. Um, Sandra, what's our next question? Jimmy, if you weren't a maker full-time, what would you see yourself doing? I really do like movie making and, you know, that's partly why I was kind of half in the TV business. <clears throat> and it's, it is a lot of people always say you always bag on the TV business. Why do you keep going back? I really do enjoy the post-production and the, and the production a aspect of being on a TV set. It definitely calls me. And that's why people say to me all the time, they're like, who edits your videos? Who shoots your videos? I say me. And they're like, you do it all. I do it all. I, I edit, I, I videotape, I don't have, I mean, I have an assistant in the shop, but you know, every, there've been a, occasions where I have an assistant on the camera, but 90%, 99% of everything I've ever done, I'll say 98% of everything I've ever shot and edited has been mine, mine alone. You know, and, and that is such a integral part of this business. Um, something that uh, uh, I've, I've been very lucky to find in a friend, uh, Troy Downs, who does uh, all the editing that I do. Um, mm -hmm. he, he, he just is a, a master at that, but it's also an art. So that just tells me that you have art in wood, metal, and now um, the, uh, uh, the theater. So Thank you. What, uh, what, what can't you do? Make money. That's the oh, one thing I don't stop know. it. Stop it. <laughs> That's my joke. I say it all the time. I, I mean, my whole life has been feast of famine. It's like I'm either, I either have money or I got nothing. It's not, I, and, and I'm used to it. You know, I'm like, I always know when to just be like, all right, we got to sell some tools. We got to sell a car. We got to, we got to, we got to buckle down and figure this out. We're going to have a couple of lean months and then I'll get a good deal and I'm good again. Yeah. You know, that's why I have like, everybody's always like, when are you going to finish that building? I'm paying for it as I go. So, you know, I'll get hits 20, $25,000 at a time. And that's when I'll put money into the building. I, you know, I don't have a loan on it or anything. Well, and that's, that's the thing with my shop is I've, I've kind of built it for, this is now my fifth year. This year, I've just kind of enclosed the outside. And matter of fact, next week, um, you know, uh, I, I think I'm going to do a tour of my shop. Um, oh, I'm cool. excited to uh, kind of show off what it is that I've spent the last two to three weeks building on. Um, yep. So uh, uh, I'm excited to show it off a little bit. I keep threatening a bandsaw tour, and that's something I'm going to do. I'll probably maybe maybe I'll do it next week. I got I'm going to do like a you know a, a collection video where I show each one of the bandsaws that I have. Well, make sure you put my name on one. And uh, yep. Now, question also: Do you have a bandsaw life shirt? I do not. I did see. I did see you were making those. I didn't get one. No. What uh, What size do you wear? Uh, the moment XL. XL. At the moment. Um, I'll, I'll make sure. Soon to be L. Uh, the, the extra L. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I'll make That's sure funny. you get one with some blades. Um, and, and we'll make sure that you got a, oh my God, that's, that's just shameless advertising right there. <laughs> I love it. Um, I'll make sure you get some stickers for those band salts. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Sandra, what's the next question? Um, Sean uh, wants to ask Jimmy, what is his picking method for finding vintage machines? Oh, you know, the easiest place now is, um, well, uh, the best thing to do if you want to be a picker is start a YouTube channel and get 1.7 million fans <laughs> because that is the best method by which I get the greatest stuff. I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would kill for 1.7 million fans, but I love the fans that I already have. <laughs> yeah, no, my, my fans have been fantastic. A lot of good stuff has come. Hey, this is something I found my neighbors, you know, not everything is given to me. It's like, Hey, my neighbor's selling this or, 
you know, my cousin has this, they don't know what to do with it. And a lot of stuff like that has come to me in that, in that regard. Um, but Facebook marketplace has been amazing. Facebook marketplace is great. Craigslist is great, but Facebook marketplace, something about Facebook marketplace. Like if you're putting it on Craigslist, you want to make money. If you're putting it on Facebook marketplace, you just want it out of the house. It tends to seem to feel that way. So that's, that's it, interesting to know. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is I believe uh, Roland Johnson last week said that he had a 36 inch Tanowitz that all he had to do was go pick it up. I said, what yeah. time do we need to be there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Tanowitz always brings big money. I see them on Facebook from time to time and they're always, you know, they're always into the thousands of dollars. It's funny though, with these big, bigger bandsaws that are starting to get a little bit of steam, you can find them for free. Or you could pay a couple thousand dollars. It's really, it's really a case by case basis. Sometimes you see ones that should be free that are being asked several thousand dollars for. In fact, on Facebook Marketplace, I think it was down near you, there was a uh, American Woodworking Tools band, so a 36 inch. I think it's a B. It's the one I have. It was on Facebook Marketplace for like fifteen hundred dollars, and the wooden wheel on top was was waterlogged and split and it was rusty it didn't have a drive pulley and the and, and it was probably missing some guard guide equipment that type of saw you know you can get for 100 bucks right this guy thought he had gold just because it was an antique not every antique is worth what people assume it's worth no trust and, me just because you're old uh trust me i'm old I, i'm not worth a lot <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's an antique, you know, it's it's just an old bandsaw. But, uh, you know, if it had some TLC, it was taken care of, the cage was intact, and, and all the guard parts, were, guide parts were intact, and, and the drive pulley and the motor, and, you know, then all of a sudden the number starts going up. But yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. The one that I have now, the, the eight, I have a, I have two, I have two 36-inch uh, American woodworking bandsaws. One I got from a fan, and that's that's a Babbitt bearing. 1920s and then the other one i bought at um an auction in louisville and that's a that has bearings in it they're both from the same era one is like you know i guess it must have been an option but they look exactly the same except for the drive bearing i i bid 600 dollars for auction on the one from louisville that was my cutoff i'm like okay i'll let it go for that much i don't really need it i, I already have one um i got it i won it and I asked some of my friends that were at the auction, I said, who else was bidding on it? They said, nobody. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you just, just never know. know. You never I was know. the only one that bid on it, so I had to pay my bidding price. Well, so it, it went to somebody's uh, trust fund. God bless them. <laughs> yeah. Sandra, what's our next question? Sean also would like to know, does Jimmy know about the Carter stabilizer? No, I don't. You mentioned that. Is that the bearing that's right behind the uh, the blade? That is the small blade guide that I use to do the small reindeers. Yeah. It, 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 and that's what I use for my bandsaw boxes, things of that. Uh, is they, that the bearing with the groove in it that, that grabs the back of the blade? That is correct. Because there's one there's one on the on the big American bandsaw that I bought, the one I just mentioned. It came with Carter guides on it, and the, the big wheel in the back has got a groove in it. Now that's a, um, those are CP guides. Those are your okay. European style guides. Um, and it may be the 500s uh, and maybe even the 600s. But uh, I hope to one day get up there and set everything up and uh, um, I'll let you know. All right, cool. Maybe you come for the October event for the, um, maybe Carter will come. Uh, we'll send you up here for uh, Catskill Mountain Maker Camp. I love it. I love it. It's turning out to be, uh, if anybody's listening and wants to know anything about the Catskill Mountain Maker Camp, you could look on The Maker's Camp on Instagram, and that's Austin. His family is running the event. It's in my town here in East Durham, New York, and it's in the Catskill Mountains. And it's a, it's a great event because it's, the family runs it. They have 100 acres. They have uh, 300 campsites, about 100 rooms, and it's there. And they love making stuff, and they love partying. So there's no rules. <laughs> it's crazy. We, we blacksmith through the night, like the blacksmith tent was rocking and rolling. It never stopped um, for three nights in a row. It's on the weekend of Columbus Day weekend. So it goes Friday, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And it's it's a lot of fun. Well, if uh, if I don't have a show already booked, uh, please send me that info. And we'll uh, do. 
see if we can't get together. Yep, and we do. It's like really loosey goosey. It's like, oh, set up whatever is easy. You know, if you want a tent, we'll make a tent for you. If you want to work outside, my sister showed up with a bunch of jewelry stuff. My sister's a jewelry. Uh, she's a platinum goldsmith and uh, diamond setter, and she set up, you know, some some simple starting things. And everybody was around her table. It was it was a lot of fun. And then a lot of people just showed up. Trading skills. That's that's the theme of the event. We trade skills. I love it. And there isn't anything better than trading your your uh, knowledge with another person. Yep. 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 Absolutely. What's your next question? Patrick with Dragonfly Aprons wants to know: Does Jimmy miss the city? <laughs> Patrick, I love Patrick. Um, I don't miss the city. In fact, um, I love it up here. I, it's funny. The city was always such a big stress point. It was. It, it's kind of like a, being in the city is kind of like a drug addiction. It's like you can't get enough of it. Being in Manhattan, and now that I'm out of it, I feel like I'm a recovered addict because. <laughs> I go to the city reluctantly. In fact, the last time I was in New York City was February 7th. I still have my apartment down there. A lot of my long-term fans know who Willie is. Willie is in my apartment right now. And because of the uh, virus, Willie usually comes up here and spends, spends the summer up here. We'll see. Once the virus relaxes a little bit, Willie will come up here and, and spend the summer with me. But he doesn't want to cross-contaminate. So he's staying put, and uh, we're staying put. So until everything relaxes and everything's safer, Willie will come up here or I'll go back down to the city and get my mail. Have you had a chance I don't miss it. to wear one of those aprons from Patrick? I haven't, but I've seen them and I, and I know what quality they are. They're beautiful. In fact, I sent Taylor uh, his Instagram just a couple weeks ago just to say, here, look at this good inspiration. Yeah, I mean, it, they just make nothing but quality. They're, they're just terrific aprons. Yep. What's our next question? Sean wants to know about rust on your machine surfaces. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, if you live in a climate like me where it gets cold at night and warm in the day, especially in the fall and the spring, you know, you're going to get some uh, you're going to get some hazy rust on your machines. The best thing to do what I do, if it's a machine that I use infrequently, like, for instance, my Tormach or my my Bridgeport mill, I just literally take 10 W30 with a paintbrush and I brush it right on the surface. Because that is going to be the only thing that keeps that. If you do WD-40, it will evaporate. You will get rust, surface rust. It's the type of rust that rubs right off, but it, it is kind of a nuisance. So if your machine sweats, just put 10W30 right on the surface of it. If it's something you use every day, just keep it. Just keep uh, you know a little bit of spray oil on it like a WD-40 that you're going to be able to just upkeep. But if it's going to be a machine that you use infrequently, you definitely got to put some thicker stuff on it. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, when it comes to woodworking machinery, I tend to wax my tables a good bit. Yep. Um, and, and not because I don't uh, think that uh, those lubes would keep from rusting, but uh, that gunk kind of gets on your wood a little bit. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm definitely, it's funny, I'm definitely talking more machinist stuff where yep. oil is on everything. But yeah, for your woodworking stuff, we definitely wax the top of the, uh, uh, the, the saw stop often. Oh yeah, going going into and out of spring, and you know all your friends that don't do woodwork that come in your shop with a sweaty drink, a beer, or a coffee, tell them to hit the road. Well, I can tell you one thing, and you can ask my wife this: if somebody comes up and they put a glass of any liquid on any metal surface, I begin to twitch. <laughs> oh yeah, my my brother, I call him the coffee ring bandit. Every time I turn around, he's leaving coffee rings on every every one of my machines. I go, get it off the table saw. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. And he puts it on the corner of the band saw. I say, get it out of here. Oh, Lord. All right, Sandra, what's our next question? Patrick wants to hear the liner voice. <laughs> I do this baby voice for the trolls. It's like, no, I want to do that voice. I want to do it. <laughs> That's me imitating the trolls. So sometimes I'll read the troll messages in that voice. And it's just, a, it's, it's been a way to burn the, the trolls, the people, uh, you know, the know-it-alls. All right. Sean wants to know, will Jimmy and Alex have a sword and reindeer standoff? Oh, for sure. For sure. Next time, you know, Alex, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I was a little intimidated by you. I remember meeting you in Springfield a couple of years ago, not this last one. I did watch your seminar, but I didn't get to say hi to you. But yep. the, the first one that I went to two years ago, I said hello to you and 
somebody introduced me as like, you know, the whiz on the bandsaw. So you said, well, I guess there's nothing I could teach you then. And I said, I, I don't know if you remember this. I said, no, 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 no. I'm totally open-minded. I don't think I know everything. And I sat there and I watched your 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 talk about how, you know, the, the teeth should be over the center of the crown, not the blade itself. And I learned a lot. I learned a tremendous amount. It was Joe Tui from uh, Arbor Tech. Oh, right. Okay. Joe, Joe introduced me. I, I remember um, vividly meeting uh, you and Joe said, you got to meet this guy. And I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> no. And you want to talk about intimidation. Um, you have way more followers than I'll ever have, but, uh, well, you know, it's honestly, it's just, I, I just, I've been at it longer. You know, a lot of people say, you know, oh, oh, oh you know, you know, you get a big head. I just been at it longer. And you know, there's been so many, that's what I love about this, this Instagram and this YouTube and this Facebook thing is that it's a complete democracy. You know, it's not like I didn't get, I, I, I certainly don't think I got famous because of any of the TV shows I've done because most of my fans don't even know that I've ever done TV. You know, I've earned all my fans through through social media. And that's what's fantastic is that anybody could start. You know, there's some fans of mine that there's some friends of mine that are surpassed me as far as viewer counts and, and sub counts that didn't have anything when I met them. You know, so it's it's amazing to see, you know, one one year I meet somebody that's like, you know, uh, has a job doing some you know civil service job, but they always wanted to do their own thing in their garage and they always have, but now with social media, they've gotten out of their own way and they're able to make a living at it. And then they, you know, the proudest moment is when they, they can come up to me and say, I quit my job and now I'm only doing this, I'm only doing that. And you know, that's such a great feeling. And social media is is a tremendous part of that. And, and it's accessible to anybody that just wants to do it. It's not like TV, you know, you need to know the right person. You need to get judged by, thousands of people that you know you make it through you know uh i i remember once there was a uh, this old this old old show i can't even remember what it was but it was a television producer and he's watching somebody playing played by james brooks and he's watching somebody on camera like on an audition tape and he turns to his assistant and i don't want to say it here but he goes would you blank this person and she goes i don't know and then he just takes the tape out and throws it in the garbage and that's the guy's whole career you know right there like that and that's what the TV business is. You know, there's no opportunity to develop a relationship with somebody. Somebody's whim, that's it. You're out. You're out of that. You're out of that network. You're out of that show. You know, you got to go back to the bricks and try and develop a relationship somewhere else. But with what we do, every single day we're making fans, and and it's about the fans. It's not about meeting a producer. It's not about getting a book publisher. It's not about meeting the right movie director. It's it's us and our fans, and that's it. And I, that's the best part about it. I think you said it best uh, uh, in one of your uh, uh, YouTube videos. You said, just do what you do and people will either love what you do mm -hmm. or they won't. A and they will always find something that you do that's helpful. So yeah, I say it to everybody, you know, just be honest. I know some, a lot of YouTubers get stuck in this persona. And then like after a year, they're like, oh, I, I hate this persona, this title I came up with myself. So when people ask me, what is the best advice that I like to give? I say, use your real name because, you know, if you want to become the face of 3M, you know, it, and let's face it, advertising is at the bottom of all this. As much as the fans sometimes don't like it, that's how we ultimately make our living is through the associations of manufacturers that sell stuff to our us and our fans. And that's kind of how we could break away from our day job. That becomes our day job. And, you know, I, I, I say you, you can't be, you know, it's very hard to be, you know, uh, the shop rat if you work at 3M. But if you are who you are, if you're Alex Snodgrass, it's more of a, a personality driven thing and less of a, a brand. So if you obviously have your brand, but I, I always say push your name as well. Absolutely. Sandra, what's our next question? Um, this is from Sterling Davis. Jimmy, you are one I can watch do anything with making, woodworking, metal, I love Sterling. leather, working, etc. because you're so creative. But when are you going to get into scroll sawing? Asking for <laughs> <laughs> He's being silly because he knows I get pick I get nitpicky with scroll saws. You know, it's like when I'm in the mood for the piece of wood in front of me to jump around at a thousand beats per second, that's when I feel, you know, like when I want that nervous energy of like, you know, 
because <laughs> I'm not paying attention or my entire upper body strength isn't like locked in. And then it goes, <laughs> and then I, like, I cut the tooth off of the face I'm, because my guard wasn't down far enough. That's, that's when I feel like those stressful moments are in need. That's when I scroll saw. You know, I, I, I started on scroll saws and I can, I can do pretty good, but I can always spot a scroll saw user when they come up to me at the show and they say, hey, can I, can I try to cut something or do something? And when they do, you, you can tell the third <laughs> joke. Like, dude, it doesn't lift. Just go easy. <laughs> oh my God. I remember as a kid, I would, I would scroll saw letters out before I was really getting into the band. So when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And I remember my, my shoulders would hurt because especially on like an old Delta Rockwell jigsaw, when it's, you know, it's like the thing feels like something that's like run by a river, you know, it's like paddle wheel powered. It's not like the fine ones today that are just like, you know, it's like a dental tool now. Yeah, really. Sandra, what's our next question? <laughs> Peter Brown said, Jimmy, is there a tool you don't have yet, but would love to find? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of Peter Brown. Shout out to Peter Brown. There's um, a couple. I. It's funny, as I'm getting older, my back is bothering me more often. I, I chopping bandsaw. I want my chopping bandsaw to be like table height. So I might make a whole new frame for the bottom of my chopping bandsaw. And then recently I was in a shop and they had this like beautiful European chopping bandsaw that's on a, you know, it's, it's like, sh it's like chest height. So the work is like, you know, just below your, your chest. So you can see what you're doing. It's not like all these chopping bandsaws are like, you got to hunch over and reach at the, you know, at the gas switch, at the pneumatic switch. So I've been thinking about either building a cage or, or stand for the one I have, or just finding a good new, a good new used one. That's uh you know, like a stand-up one or a cold saw where you pull it down slow. That's more for metal work, both of those machines. All right, we're going to see if we can't get to a few more questions for you. Sandra? Uh, Sean wants to know what bandsaw tire does he like to use? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I, I was having a problem with, I have a Delta metal cutting bandsaw and it has silicone tires on it and with the oil and everything it keeps slipping off i almost today just pulled the tire off because if i push really hard and i watched what happened i took everything apart i took all the the, the the covers off and i cut to see what was going on the minute the blade seizes the silicone slipping because it's got oil on it under the blade so i personally because i i'm just so used to the hard rubber like on the old on the old deltas they seem to have more of a grab than the silicone. Am, am I wrong at that? No, not absolutely not. Rubber, um, it, it can take those petroleum products, whereas a urethane tire cannot. That yeah. urethane tire, what happens is that oil gets just underneath the tire, and then you have oil slipping, which yeah. builds that heat. And once a urethane tire gets hot, it's going to stretch out and be gone. So. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. You cannot use urethane for metal products that you're going to put petroleum products on and yeah. expect it to last for any length of time. So, I mean, I know a lot of metal cutting bandsaws don't even have tires. You know, they just have like a track and, you know, you just, you just take the wear that, that would potentially happen for the teeth. So uh, I'm going to give this a couple more chances. I adjusted it a little. I was thinking of you today because I adjusted the crown back and everything. And, uh, I'll give it some more time and see what happens. If it becomes more of a problem, I'm just going to just take that bottom rubber tire off and just let it go steel on steel. Uh, with a metal cutting blade, it probably wouldn't hurt it a whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> What's our next question, Sandra? Gus Hall wanted me to ask Jimmy, how does he like turning wood on a lathe? Oh, you know, it's funny. I just did two lathe projects in a row. Of course, this mallet I just talked about. And uh, these stools, I have, I'm hap I happen to be sitting on them right now, these stools I just made. Um, it's great. I'm not a wood turner per se, you know, so I'm still figuring it out. You'll notice in the videos, if a wood turner will watch very closely and they'll see everything I'm doing wrong. Even just a few little things I showed on Instagram, I got a lot of notes. And, uh, but like anything, it's like I gotta, I got, I'm a little stubborn. I like to figure this out for myself. And I'm, and I'm turning something really long and it's vibrating in the middle. And then I'm trying to adjust the, the, the pitch of the cut and I'm going this way and I'm going that way. And I'm 
trying to fine tune where it's not going to vibrate. So I like turning stuff. It's a challenge. Sometimes it's a little frustrating. Uh, it's nice when you turn something that's like beefy, but when yeah. you turn something that's dainty and it's like, yeah, I like turning the, the bigger bowls, but I'm not really a turner. I'm a scraper. And, yeah. uh, you know, to go back to your first uh, remark, people tell you you do something wrong? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <laughs> uh, what's our next question? Peter wants to know, is 10W30 car oil, what you were talking about earlier? Yep, I just put on a, just a big gob of car oil. That's it, motor oil. This, 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 it will not rust. Like my, again, mostly on my machining. Well, a funny story. So I have a, um, I have a big giant crescent. It's an 18-inch crescent joiner that I bought in Springfield, Massachusetts, in fact. And uh, I bought it on Craigslist. And I had nowhere to put it, but it was a good deal. So I bought it and I set it down in my backyard close to electric. I had nowhere to put it inside. So I had it outside. And in, I said, I bought it knowing that one day I'd have a shop big enough to house it and all of my other tools. And so it sat outside under a tarp, but every time I used it, I wiped all the motor oil off with, with, with the uh, uh, sawdust. I would get gobs of sawdust, pour it all over it let it soak in and just sweep off the motor oil. I'd use it outside. And then when I was done with it, I would just pour motor oil all over the decks and just rub it in and then put a tarp over it. And that's how I it lived outside that way for two years. Wow. And when I needed it, I just get a big five gallon bucket of sawdust and pour it all over it and rub all the motor oil off and then do the same thing again. Is, is that detergent or non-detergent? <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> Whatever is cheaper. In fact, <laughs> used works too, as long what as you can stand the stink. <laughs> Patrick wants to know, do you leave the tension on the bandsaw when you're done working or release it? I have so many bandsaws, I can't keep up. I keep the tension on all of them. You know, and, and I tell people that, uh, yes, you should probably take the tension off in between use. Um, at the end of the day, I should say, and the yeah. only reason that you should is um, basically when you have a, a wheel or a blade tensioned, it doesn't hurt the blade, it doesn't hurt your saw. But what it's doing is it's leaving the top and the bottom of those tires flat. So yeah. until they warm up, you get a little open vibration. It also yeah. gives you a little bit of blade flutter because uh, those tires are flat. Um, and uh, so if you take the tension off, in between use, you'll eliminate that. But if you've left it on there, let the saw run for a minute. The tires will warm up and the lope and vibration yeah. will go away. I, I don't do it, but I should do it more often. Say if I'm using like a 14 TPI eighth inch deep blade, I notice if you don't take the tension off and you cut a lot, like I've been, I used to cut lots and lots of name plates, I would start to feel the tick in the blade, tick, 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 tick. And then you'd look and you'd see a crack right between the teeth. And the crack would eventually work its way to the back and the blade would break. But right. sometimes if you leave that tension on there, you're just stretching that. And the only place it's going to start to give is right between the teeth. And it's going to start cracking backwards towards the flat side. It basically, that blade elopes. An eighth inch blade is really bad at that. Anytime that you yeah. have an eighth inch blade, if you over tighten it, it tends to elope on that front edge. And then it's like trying to keep a string on the saw very difficult to keep on that side. And then you'll notice once those blades break and you take them and you go to throw them away, you, they'll just snap every six inches. That's when the blade has been over tension for so long. They just break apart. They're so yeah. brittle. Absolutely. Sandra, what's our next question? Sean wants to know what wood and sealer does Jimmy use on wooden spoons? Oh, uh, you know, I have my, my, my buddy Tracy Chavant from Kansas and his wife uh, Katrina, they come here and they've taught classes. So he's found in my yard, locust, ash, and they prepared a lots of pieces, even walnut, lots of walnut that they brought here uh, from Kansas. But I have lots of pieces laying around of those particular species and they've prepared lots of them. I mean, so much of them that I, I, I could probably make enough spoons to uh, probably give everybody in Greene County a spoon <laughs> and a fork. So well, out of those species, I'm probably not going to run out. 
Tracy and his wife Katrina are, are could not be nicer folks. Um, oh, you guys do the show circuit together. You must hang out with them a lot. Yeah, they're amazing. See them a good bit. They're they're super nice folks and super knowledgeable when it comes to the uh, um, grinding and making those spoons. Yeah, they're they're amazing. So, what's our next question? Sean wants to know what your favorite tool is. <laughs> Bandsaw. Absolutely. <laughs> Is there a lot of people named Sean, or is this the same guy? <laughs> it's the same Sean. I don't okay. think him, but he's asking a lot of questions. What's our next? Is good. Gus wants to know how much sleep Jimmy gets per night. <laughs> uh, I get about five solid hours a night, at least. Five or six. I used to go to bed at exactly midnight and wake up at exactly six for a very long time. Uh, that was when I was working out because I'd work out at 6 a.m. So I'd go to bed at exact, like, no matter what I was doing, I would drop and go to bed at midnight and then I'd wake up at six. So I'm really used to just getting like five or six hours of sleep a night. Well, you know, uh, everybody needs their rest. Uh, it, it seems like the older I get, the earlier I set, I tend to wake up. Um, I, lately it's been 4.30. I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, 4.30 in the morning, I am awake. And, uh, you know, um, obviously I wait until coffee time, but uh, it, 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 it's getting earlier and earlier. But I will also tell you that I'm pretty much in the bed by 9, 9.30 every night. Lately, like for the last year, year and a half, like on the average, not every night, but on the average, I go to sleep at about 3 and I wake up at about 8. Jeez. 8, 8.30. Give or take. There you go. And that's be that's because I edit myself. I'm always every, like the last thing I do every night before I go to bed is edit. And a lot of times, uh, my girl and I will go to bed together earlier. And once I know she's completely dead asleep, I like lift her hand and I go like this, and then I sneak out of bed and I go edit. She knows it too. She does it. You know, every night I just go away. I go, let's go to bed. So we go to bed. We fall asleep to Netflix or something, and then I like I get out of bed and I go and I edit every night. Why don't you just put a mirror underneath their nose to make sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I always joke. I say, I, I always know when she's asleep because Netflix is on and she's staring at the screen with her eyes closed. <laughs> so the minute we put on Netflix, the two of us immediately, like, we've never, ever watched past, like, 10 minutes of anything ever. Well, yeah. We so, try. So go to sleep. Um, TV is, uh, what is that? Uh, on CNN forensic files oh yeah, yeah yeah that's great yeah headline news forensic files i listened oh, to it in my car i told my father that and he said keep an eye on that girl <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no I, I i actually cut the cord with my television i was mad at tv the last show i did was for discovery channel in 2011 and that summer when the show got got kind of well i don't know if it got canceled i'm still waiting for the phone call they just never called me back um we I, I canceled my cable subscription, and, I, and that was it. I haven't had cable since 2011. I also have to tell you that Sandra's favorite tool is the wood chipper. So, oh, yeah. in the forest, okay? Well, tell Sandra it's easy to chip somebody when they're frozen. Just in case she's... <laughs> I am not sure how you know that, but I don't know. I don't know. Thank you, brother. All right. <laughs> it's cleaner. It's cleaner. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Uh, Peter <laughs> wants to know, Jimmy, what's the first thing you want to do after the lockdown? Uh, probably go to the city, to be honest with you, and go, and go check out my apartment, go to my P.O. box. But honestly, I'm in no rush to do that. If the lockdown was lifted tomorrow, I probably wouldn't go for a couple of months. Yeah. It's a strange thing. I guess, you know, I do want to go. I was looking forward to going to Europe. And it's we're still doing our Maker Central thing in August. Hopefully everything gets lifted um, by then and that everybody can keep their commitments. But, uh, you know, I was going to go to Europe and potentially maybe go see Jocko, whatever, this summer and, you know, get on a plane again. I mean, the last time I was on a plane, I flew to Kansas City and uh, I got back here March 7th. Wow. And then two or three days later, everyone's like, did you see anybody with masks on? Was anybody wearing a mask? And on that particular airline flight, I only saw two people at the airport with masks on. And, you know, then I think it was March 11th is when I heard Coachella was closed. And then Tom Hanks had 
the, the virus and that the NBA was closed, like everything was like boom, 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 like four days later. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I, I've uh, I've kind of followed the guidelines uh, best I could. Uh, matter of mm-hmm. fact, I've got some real nice friends up in uh, uh, Michigan, uh, Ron and Lana Campbell. Uh, they made me a mask, and and they know that I'm a, a huge bourbon fan, and so nice. they made me a Blanton's mask. So yeah, thank you, Jim. Thank you. My rest. <laughs> you mean Blanton's like the the whiskey that has the horses? Yes. Yep. So uh, they made me that mask with that. So oh, that's nice. Uh, I I have yet to have anybody look at it and go Blanton's. <laughs> Do you have the Blanton? Do you have all all uh, the the letters of the Blanton horse? Um, I'm I'm got a pretty good collection going. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Do you have the carousel? Uh, I might might have the theme park. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, I am uh, matter of fact, I, and I forgot to tell you, and I, I don't even know whether or not you drink or, or mm-hmm. not. Uh, but at 750, we, we tend to hoist a, a little bit <laughs> of it is you're drinking. And, I got my, oh yeah, that's right. What, what is it that you have in that diarrest? No, I'm just, I'm a coffee drinker. My fans know that, that I've been sober for 32 years now. I stopped drinking when I was 20. <laughs> I'm sorry, but at the same time, I know everything about marketing about whiskey because I have my closest friends are in the the bullet bourbon business. Ah, beautiful. So my close one of my closest buddies in the whole world is is the ambassador for bullet bourbon, and I do a lot of work with bullet bourbon for many years now, going on like seven or eight, nine years. I've been working with a lot of the stuff in Kentucky. So even though I don't drink, I know everything there is to know about whiskey uh, through I'm my friends. Your closest friends. <laughs> yep. That's why I knew about Blanton's and like. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about horses? Sure. Like if all these little marketing person. nuances I, I know a little bit about. <laughs> all right, Sandra, what's our next question? Ed Swanson wants to know, Alex, would you consider coming to Maker Camp? You know, uh, I would uh, I would love to come to Maker's Camp. Oh, you? I'm like, I'm going to be there. I live down the block. I'll be there. <laughs> You're talking about you. Um, yep. Do you know who was it that, that asked that? Ed Swanson. Uh uh, are you uh do you know ed swanson uh may, maybe i do i'm not sure if i know him you know a lot of my fans i know their first name and their face uh, i would i would consider it an honor to, to come to maker's camp It'd be fun yeah absolutely get you blacksmithing uh you know uh, I, I do again i am a huge fan of forged and fire um, and, and every time I watch it, I, my wife, I know she's just watched me spend five years uh, putting this shop together. I know she cringes going, oh, my God, not another hobby. <laughs> oh, believe me, I got into it three years ago. And uh, my assistant, Brett, who was my assistant for three years, Brett got me into it. And uh, I love it. It's now it's, you know, I try and figure out a way to, to do like lately. Now that the weather broke, I built myself a blacksmith shop in the back. I built a blacksmith shop that uh, is outside. It's open to the air. So when it warms up, it's been warming up. I've been going out there late at night and I love it. I, I just, I just made about 15 nails trying to get eight good ones for this video that I made. So I just made a, a bunch of nails. So my, my whole upper body is like really worked out. Nice. Well, you know, my, work ne- out. my next uh, pitch is going to be, but honey, Jimmy does it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Get yourself an anvil and a hammer. You can get those things at home afraid at the very least. That's right. It, it'll help uh, build the guns. That's it. All right. What's our next question? Jim Heavey wants to know, when you wake up at 4 or 4.30 in the morning, you go right to the gym, right? Um, you know, Jim, I'm going to say <laughs> no. <laughs> I do not have the gumption that Jim Heavey has. Um, Jim Heavey, man, this guy is... He is in, in incredible shape, makes me look sick every morning that he comes to the show. You know, he's just finished like a 27 mile run uh, <laughs> and he's smiling. That's incredible. <laughs> I, I used to have that. I lost it somewhere along the way, but I devoted all that energy now to making YouTube videos. So it's not lost, on, not totally lost, you know, that I'm energy. Not, I, I'm not going to lie. Never had it. Never wanted yeah. it. I used to run about I used to run about five to eight miles a week 10 years ago and I was very lean and and uh in in good shape and you know it was great because I could really eat whatever I want without abandon and not even worried about 
you know, now I got to like, do I have four slices of pizza or six? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I used to eat six oh. without even thinking about it. Yeah, well, if you swing a hammer all day, you're allowed six. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. So um, I don't know if you know R&R &R Builders. Uh, he's the guy that built my barn. A lot of a lot, a lot of YouTubers and Instagrammers and Facebook guys know Kyle. And Kyle is like, he looks like a, a, a running back for, you know, a college football team. He's he's in amazing shape. He's very handsome. He's very likable. He's, he's so charming. He's like one of the nicest guys I know in the whole world. And he like he has so many fans that look up to him. He builds buildings incredibly. He built my building in the backyard. And together when he spent two weeks here while he worked in my building in 2017 and by by popular demand fans were like why don't you guys do a meetup and so we did a meetup at my new shop down the block the one i had just rented it was a big a big empty warehouse at the time now it's full of tools so i did my fans came from like all around the area and his fans came from all around the area and right down the middle of the room all my fans looked like comic book nerds they were all like big bellies beards his side of the room looked like the, the, the starting lineup for the New York Jets. I mean, because all they do all day long is frame houses and put up sheetrock and siding and roofing. <laughs> all my fans do all day long is just sit at a table and just like move their arms. That's it, you know, or a little bit of table saw work. Or <laughs> they only pick up sticks of wood that are like, you know, all his guys are like moving sheetrock and full sheets of plywood. So those yeah. are funny. Well, I'm I'm pretty sure Jim will probably outlive me by about uh, I don't know thirty or forty years, um, and he's pretty much already about ten or fifteen years older than I am. So, <laughs> um, what's our next question? Sterling Davis wants to know: Did you rebook for Maker Central in August? Did I rebook? No, I never even booked my trip. I always hedge my bet. I, I wait for the really good deals, you know, like the type of airline deal you can get like two days before you fly to Europe. That's that's my habit. That's what I love to do. I love to book it. So it's like, do you want to pay 5000 for, or do you want to pay 5200 if you leave it too? You know, so I'm really bad when it comes to airline tickets. I literally book when it's like, I have a gun to my head and it's like, okay, you have to leave in like three days, get a ticket. And that's when I get my ticket. I'm just really bad like that. And in this case, it worked out because I didn't buy a ticket to go in May. And obviously, the show has been pushed. So, Wow. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm probably complete opposite of that. I, I have to know three months before I leave what I'm doing. And my wife has a schedule. Uh, oh, I don't, I, I don't know any. I forget everything. <laughs> I am the worst. Like, actually, I was about to go do my beauty shots for the mallet in the back. And Aaron, my assistant, goes, don't you have a live stream at 6 o'clock? I'm like, oh, because I was about to go to the supermarket to go buy a watermelon to smash. <laughs> and that's when I texted you. I was like, are we good? Oh, you texted me. You're like, you're good to go. Here's the meeting. Yeah. Entrance. Sandra? Sean wants me to ask Jimmy if he has any tools that are odd, like the way pinched knurler. I don't know what I know what he's talking about okay. the knurler for his knife that he okay. just made or did I say that right Sorry. Oh, I, I I did I have this like hand knurler where you kind of it's like a C clamp and you're wrapping around stuff like in fact I did this on my my flashlight with that knurler right this is my pocket flashlight um I'm always looking for odd tools so, you know that's kind of part of like the buzz that I do with the guys at the fits all podcast we're always looking for oddball tools tools that you know, my friend was here recently and he showed me something he had in his collection. Um, and it's a machine that shakes martinis made in the 1920s. And I did some research on a type of machine that's like worth like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 if you have an original, you know, made by some fancy company. But it's a crank thing. You crank it and these two martini cups do this. And, you know, it's really more of a showpiece for like a Prohibition era bar. That's when it was made. Huh. Um, so I'm always looking for oddball tools. You know, whenever I'm in a junkyard that has that's full of tools, I'm always looking for stuff. At the moment, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head that I could showcase or talk about. But, you know, it's it's definitely a passion, just finding oddball tools and, you know, knowing the history behind weird tools. Eric from Hand Tool Rescue uh, is great at that. He always has the coolest, weirdest, oldest tools. Yeah. They, they, finding unique tools uh, is pretty um 
Well, it, it it's fun to see how they used to do things for sure. Um, it's not. It's it's interesting because like when you think about how things were manufactured back in the day, one hundred percent done out of somebody's hand and paper. That's it. Uh, you know, I, nothing was done on a computer. About the easy way. How do we do this the easy way? Even when you give me a, a two three thousand dollar machine and I don't think it's going fast enough, my mind immediately says, "What is the easy way?" Here? Yeah. So. Uh, that's just my thought process. Sandra? Um, sorry. Troy would like to know what software do you use for editing videos? I use iMovie that comes with a Macintosh computer. And I, I have uh, Final Cut Pro too, but I, I like iMovie mostly. I, I almost always use iMovie. Um, it's just easier. There's less, less choices. You know, for a simple cut edit program, there's not too many. There's not too many keyframe choices or anything. It's just fairly simple. And uh, I use Adobe Illustrator for doing all my vector stuff. So if I'm going to set up a, a cut path, even if it's a cut path that I'll bandsaw out, or if it's a cut path that I'll laser cut out, or if I'm going to CNC it or plasma cut it, I start in Illustrator everywhere. And from Illustrator, I I, I could put a PDF in the laser cutter. I could put an Illustrator file in the in the Plasma Cutter programming. I could put an Illustrator file into the Vectrix programming, so I could make a, a wooden CNC cut. Um, and I'll use Photoshop a little bit for some more marketing stuff. But when it comes to this digital fabrication, I, I use Illustrator nearly exclusively. And I believe Troy is uh, he's the, just been an incredible friend to me lately. He is the uh, publicist that has done a lot of my stuff lately. He's just- Oh, angry. fantastic. So, Sandra? Patrick wants to know, is Patrick done wiring your house? Oh, Patrick Reynolds is my friend and uh, he's part of the family here. Patrick uh, is still working. We have a couple of projects. He might start working on one this week. And he said to me, I need fodder for my new YouTube channel. If you want anything done in the house, just let me know. <laughs> so he goes, I get a video, you get a new outlet or a switch or a new wire. And uh, yeah, so it, the, I don't think the electrical work here is ever going to stop. There's always new needs and wants. Like we rearrange the room and we're like, oh, wow, it's too bad there's not a plug there for a lamp. Patrick? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. It, it goes on forever. And the shop that we're still working on, you know, it's not finalized yet, the locations of all the machines because we haven't closed the wall, which now, I mean, it's just an, ex I'm just hoping to get a free floor from a company that puts up free floors. So. Wow. Anybody make free floors? <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> you put that cup up one more time. There you, come on now. Bring, there you go. Does anybody know flooring? There you go. I, mean, I just, uh, uh, matter of fact, went and bought several 220 outlets and so forth that I'll be putting on the new uh, uh, extension of the shop and going to be mm -hmm. my lathe, my new big uh, edge sander. Uh, joiner, all of that on the out, outer part. Um, so I know all about the wiring or I will this weekend for sure. Yeah. All right. Now we've only got about three minutes left. Um, oh, well. Sandra? Gus Hall Go to know who, Jimmy, who's your biggest maker inspiration in your early years? Who was? Uh, I guess, you know, I would have to say it's, a, it's an easy answer, but it is the truth. My dad, my dad is the one, who, my dad's still alive. He's 80. He still tinkers a little bit. Um, my dad was curious. He still is very curious growing up. And he, he, he instilled in me the curiosity to always be interested in new technologies, new things, new. He, in fact, he had a computer he bought from Radio Shack probably four years before I ever was interested in buying a Macintosh. I just never, I would go to his house and he'd show me this thing and this program for playing solitaire. And, this, and I'm like, what a waste of time that thing is. What do you need a computer for? Yeah. And then of course, you know, the computers, if you don't have a computer, you know, you don't, you're not, you're not participating in society. Right. Um, but my dad was always curious. My dad had all the toys before anybody else. And as a gift to him, early one of his father's days, uh, I bought him a digital camera. I, I saw Kodak. I put out a digital camera. It was the first digital camera I had ever seen in my life. It's the first one I ever purchased. And I bought it for him. And I was like, I don't care about digital photography. I mean, I, at the time, I was vaguely interested in regular photography. I, I've since 
that's seriously involved in regular photography and of course digital now that's all life but at the time going back 25 years ago i bought him a kodak digital camera and he was like whoa what is this i never saw one of these so i mean my dad's very curious about new technology so early on my dad was my guy i mean my dad bought me my first bandsaw the one i still i still have it i'll show it in the collection video that i'm going to do um he uh, got me sets of chisel, put them in front of me, and he saw in me what I didn't see in me yet. Wow. I, uh, I, I can't agree more. My father is uh, uh, very close to 80, and I get to work with him every year. Uh, he right. has come out, and uh, we've worked together for years and years. And, you know, you, you look over there, and you just know that uh, that's, that's, that's your roots. A funny story, 10 years ago when I injured my hand, I injured my pinky on my table saw. I cut my pinky off on a table saw. And to, they, the little piece of skin didn't get cut through. So they considered it a full amputation, although they put it back on. And uh, that was on a Delta Unisaw. Since now I have saw stops. But my dad came to help me because I was in the middle of a job. And so my dad came in to the city, into my shop for the first time with me since I graduated college in, the, in 1990. So this was in 2010. It was 20 years that we hadn't worked together side by side. He came in to assist me in my workshop. And he was like a helper that just got out of college. He kept his mouth shut. He's like, this is your world. I have no, I have no idea what you're doing. Because I was creating all kinds of fun, cool stuff, you know, with interior designers. It was not like cut and paste type of stuff. Like, you know, my dad did very simple cabinets. This was all complicated uh, made to fit in an apartment and my dad was there to help me paint and you know help me move wood around the whole time I'm in a cast and we're trying to do something and uh so that was really fun I mean it was it, it never would have happened if hadn't I got injured but uh you know the fact that it did happen was very nice he spent a few days with me he stayed in my apartment and he helped me out and he's like wow he goes I learned so much just hanging out and working with you in a whole new capacity that he hadn't done. He had. He's kind of retired at that time. He didn't really. He doesn't really work that hard anymore. Well, um, it, we we're pretty much there. But uh, I'm going to get one more question in for you, Jimmy. Cool. Um, Kelly Burns would like to ask both of you: Whose YouTube channel do you never miss? Oh, I know. I mean, I could say Colin Furs and this old Tony. Absolutely. Uh, I and, would, uh, I would have to say uh, Mark Spagnola, um, mm -hmm. and uh, eh, I, I think I, I've learned to watch a lot more of April Wilkinson. Uh, April's she, great too. Yeah, she's, she's great. And, and of course Matt Cremora, um, absolutely. Yep. Uh, they're they're all up and coming. Uh, Mark kind of paved the the way, and April Mark is definitely Matt. one of the originals. He definitely opened the door for all of us. I would yeah. say so. Yeah, uh, absolutely, great guy. And just just been an honor to work with uh, uh, Mark. Um, I would love to work with April and Matt. Know them both pretty well, um, just mm -hmm. through business, and uh, uh, they they could not be nicer people. April's on fire. She's amazing. What she, she's doing. Great, great gal. Well, uh, Jimmy, I, again, I cannot thank you enough for thank taking you. The time. Um, and uh, I hope you'll try to join us again. Anytime. Anytime. Uh, when I'm, Sean have Sean build up a bunch of questions, and Sean could tech, tell you in the next thing if he has any more questions, and then we'll we'll book me again. A lot more questions you guys are going to have to go through and answer. Just so you know. <laughs> Give Sean uh, my number; he can call me directly. There you go, uh, <laughs> Jimmy. I want to call you here in just a few minutes again. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you are a wealth of knowledge, and uh, thank you. Apparently, uh, a lot of folks are. Uh, uh, highly interested in uh, what you do. Uh, keep watching him, um, and uh, we'll probably see you all next week. Again, Thank you, everybody. Probably do a shop tour, so I hope everybody will see us then. Do Jim, I stay on? Are you going to go live? Are you going to just cut the live feed, or I, I you know what? I, I'll just give you a call. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go. Bye. Thank you. See you.